know. Um, thank you for having me. And uh, the right to roam, wandering from workplace to land and home. Create wandering. Wandering cannot be forced. It comes unbidden, but will not come at all without the time spent wandering, physically and mentally. Free to roam the ego along with its driving agendas, overly rational thinking and self-critique is subdued. Unleashed, the conscious freer self emerges in this state of true presence. Illumination moves freely, uncovering fresh ideas like turning over a stone in a stream. Mary Oliver wrote, Creative work needs solitude. It needs concentration without interruptions. It needs the whole sky to fly in and no eye watching until it comes to that certainty which it aspires to. The ideas in all their shimmering forms, in spite of all our conscious discipline, will come when they will and on the swift upheaval of their wings. Imbalance. Staring at the monitor, another notification flashes on the screen, fracturing my focus. I work through the bottomless pit of emails in pursuit of an empty inbox. Committing myself to completing five tasks a day, I optimistically write them on the whiteboard near my desk. The phone rings. I'm cheerful. I love my job. I serve artists from around the globe with meaningful experiences, workshops, retreats trips. The office door opens. A, mem a board member pops in just wanting to say hi, then tells me of a new great idea. 45 minutes later, I heat up my lunch and take it to my desk, return a call to one of our instructors, smoothing out details. I must get back to the budget. The knot in my neck starts throbbing, and I reach for a pain reliever. I have a wrist brace on my Velcro right hand, minimizing the stinging pain of carpal tunnel. Calendar alert, chiropractor in 20 minutes. Nothing is yet crossed off that whiteboard. John O'Donoghue wrote, most of us are moving for such an undergrowth of excess that we cannot sense the shape of ourselves anymore. The nonprofit administrator's balance sheet Excesses, communications, program planning, implementation, work hours, blurring, home and office, budget creation, management, fundraising efforts, venue planning, relations, travel details, scarcities, consistent cash flow, support staffing, livable wages, benefits, office management, financial stability, free, unencumbered time. What are you waiting for by Kai Seidenberg? <laughs> what powerful seeds lie dormant within you, longing to break through the surface and reach their slender stems toward the light? What tender buds are swelling inside you, yearning to unfurl their radiant petals and reveal their hidden beauty? What songs and stories are swirling deep within your breasts? What wild and magical dreams are stirring your soul? What are you waiting for, dear one? The world is hungry for your beauty, calling you to bring forth your deepest gifts. Darkness. In mid-December 2019, I hit send announcing 220, the 220 calendar of artists workshops, retreats and trips. Immediately online enrollments start mounting, but in mid-February, they dwindle. Then they come to a complete halt. On March 25th, the board of directors hold an emergency meeting. After receiving news that our partnering venues have canceled one by one, like a string of falling dominoes, how could the organization recover from losing all re revenue for the entire year? They voted to file a dissolution, the nonprofit version of bankruptcy and I became unemployed. Let this darkness be a bell tower, Rilke. Quiet friend who has come so far, feel how your breathing makes more space around you. Let this darkness be a bell tower and use the bell as you ring. 
what battery becomes your strength? Move back and forth with the change. What is it like such intensity of pain? If the drink is bitter, turn yourself to wine. In this uncontainable night, be the mystery at the crossroads of your senses, the meaning discovered there. And if you, if the world has ceased to hear you, say to the silent earth, I flow to the rushing water, speak, I am. Dissolution is a noun, the closing down of dismissal of an assembly, partnership, or official body, the action or process of dissolving or being dissolved. Dissolution became the very process that I too was undertake, to undertake. I, the administrator, had to dissolve so that the other I, the artist, could reform. I returned to the land, hiking, drawing in nature, and embracing the sense of wonder I had been missing behind my administrative desk. Reflections from lockdown. Despite the many hardships of lockdown, there were many small miracles. Gorgeous skies where, without the planes emitting fuel into our atmospheres. Aquatic life returned to ports that had been host to polluting cruise ships. The Venice canals became clear with views of shoals of tiny fish, previously unseeable in murky waters. Wild animals began exploring quieted cities like the mountain goats in Cladidno, Wales, who wandered the streets emboldened by the presence, the absence of noise polluters. Many mothers forced to stay home with their children now refused to return to the chaos of two jobs, the day job of, and the bigger job of mothering. Scores of employees soon chose to work and live rurally, to have space to wander, to roam. These shifts fostered a migration of workers unwilling to return to the workplace, often defined as toxic. I too knew the destructiveness of stress and financial pressure and what it was doing to my mental and physical health, but I was powerless to stop it. COVID did stop it. Losing my job allowed me to come home to my true self. There are others whose relationships to their jobs have been altered too. Glimmers of light. Anne packed up her office to do her job as a university budget analyst from home during lockdown. Work from home allowed her to take on online art classes, work in her garden, take walks during her flexible work hours. This spring, she was ordered to return to the office. Anne finds she and her colleagues have little interaction now, and meetings are still conducted by Zoom. Nathan taught all his university classes online during lockdown. Working from home allowed him to paint outdoors daily. He found a deeper level of engagement with the landscape. Nathan tells me, one day I was presented with very dim light, seen through sheets of rain. Being able to wander more than usual, I painted through the rainstorm while sitting in a shed. I found a new way to look at light, not in my typical formula realized way, but from sheer presence. Ezra tells me a job is a job. The parameters are universal. The nature of the work is the same. The stress that comes with the work is the same, but where you do your work has a profound impact on how you do the work. Ezra provides tech support for a major US bank working from home. During COVID, he and his wife moved out of a crowded city to live rurally. Ezra knows that without quiet spaces in nature, without room to wander, he doesn't have the antidote for the work hours at his computer. Now he does. Darkness and light. Pre-dawn, looking out the narrow window of my upstairs bedroom. Excuse me, I missed a slide. There we go. I gaze through the treetops as dawn awakens the day. Each morning is a new story of light emerging from darkness through atmospheric variances. Reaching for a piece of graphite, I quickly draw. If I turn on the lamp to see my paper, the mystery of the morning light dissipates, so drawings are done blind. This simple 10-minute dedication has kept my artist's eyes sharp, even as an administrator. 
Now these morning drawings chronicle my personal journey through darkness to light. Stillness. In the soft light of the leafless late autumn woods, the bare trees, tree trunks rise in a pale rose gray glow. There is barely a sound to be heard. No other breathing souls, no rumbling of car engines, no planes overhead. Only the sound of the footfalls as we approach the granite bluff. Not yet twilight, we take in the vista with its subtle colors and textures. We discuss what our paint palettes would look like if we attempted to mix colors that would describe these subtleties, so visually captivating. Then we just look, breathe, and let the moment infuse our souls. On the hike back out of the woods, an indelible image of rows of sturdy, pale gray vertical tree trunks imprint my memory. The stillness is palpable. We depart in a state of calm renewal. Conclusion. Without the right to roam, to move freely from workplace to other landscapes, whether a garden plot, a mountaintop, or roaming the depths of one's talents and gifts, we limit ourselves while the busyness constrains creative work and crushes fresh ideas. Thank you. Thank you for that. Normally we'll read questions until the end. I, I need to, okay, skip. there we go. Um, let me get out of this so that we can get to the other one, but I can't seem to do it. Maybe someone else is there. Welcome, Bauer. Um, so thank you. Um, so I'm um, Dr. Veronica Salako from Aberystwyth University. Um, I'll start. In Australia, there's a tradition of giving thanks to the, to the traditional landowners for allowing uh, access to their land. So I would like to thank the traditional landowners of Bristol for allowing me to roam on their land. And I'd also like to thank the conference organisers for um, inviting us to come and present our papers. So We Live With The Land is a multidisciplinary art exploration that invited artists whose work responded to the history story of the land, language and land, a sense of place and the environmental and rewilding movement. I should have. I conceived this project after completing a PhD which, uh, in visual arts, which had visualised an endangered and a minority language, Gunai Gurnai, which is from Victoria in Australia, and Comrai, Welsh, through the notion of country. As I come from Australia, the state of Australian Indigenous languages, culture, and environment has always been my main, main interest and thus provided the main research focus. Living in Wales while completing the PhD meant the Welsh language, landscape and culture provided the framework in which I worked. And the New South Welsh offered a decolonial strategy in which I could displace the dominant language, English, of the two countries. As with any PhD, there were tracks I did not follow. These tracks were environmental questions that arose during the research. This project, funded by the Joy Welsh Foundation and supported by the School of Art at Aberystwyth University, aimed to extend my research by exploring Wales-based artists and writers' response to the land. I used the term Wales-based artists as opposed to Welsh artists because I wanted to include all artists living in Wales, both Conroy, Welsh, and Tikunt, who, like me, had moved to Wales. All artists involved were working on land-based and environmental projects or visualising the landscape. The project was framed within the theories of environmental theorists, Andrew Concern and Val Plumwood, who argue that by listening and acknowledging the land agency, we, humans, can provide a new way to interrogate the land's current and historical usage. There are many ways in which I could have gained the information I wanted. I could have met and interviewed artists, read and wrote articles, but I wanted to follow Professor David Crystal's statement that if we want them, the general public, 
to see what the situation is, the artist can help us more than anyone else. With this statement, Crystal was arguing that although lecturing and academic books play an important role in forming intellectual opinion, they reach only a small selected and audience, and thus the information and knowledge needs to be disseminated in other ways. Practice-led research and the resulting exhibitions are a valid way to disseminate research by permitting a wider audience to be impacted by the research and a different conversation to occur. And this was a conversation I wanted not only to hear, but also as a visual artist and someone who has chosen to make Comrie her home, I wanted to join in. So rather than visiting artists or conducting online interviews, I organised a series of retreats for the artists with an aim to interact on a more personal level with the artists and to foster opportunities for discussions away from their normal work and home setting. The retreats were held during December and January at Studio Maylor, an artist residency program in Corrid that has been closed down for the last two years. So this was the start of reopening it. Torres is situated on the southern side of the Snowdonia Park in a narrow valley of mostly man-made forest with its history of plate mining still very much in evidence. It is close to the Centre for Alternative Technology and has changed over the years from a slate mining town to a forgotten rather hippieish village with very low house prices into yet another place overwhelmed by holiday let Airbnb high house prices, tourists, and we have fabulous hiking and bike trails, all of which has and is forming the environment and the people who live there. During the four day retreat, artists would each day as a group go for a walk to explore the local environment, introduce their work process as processes, and in the evening give a talk which was presented online and live. This allowed other people to attend the talk and join in the conversation about the land. A final retreat was held in the last weekend of May at Place Vodka, an empty 100-year-old manor house on a five-acre property on Ennis Mond, Ennis Mond Anglesey. This retreat offered a different environment to experience and provided a final opportunity to explore the ideas of the group. The work that has resulted from these retreats and the artist's response to the questions that have arisen in the discussions is currently being exhibited at the school um, at the Everest of University School of Art Galleries. On this retreat, Julie Upmeyer, participating artist and custodian, to use an Australian term, or owner, to use a British term, of Place Podza, arranged for a local man, Gareth, to lead a work through the Clangoy Commons in Abertine the Old Woodland. Gareth has been involved in the development of the woodlands and was very proud of the development group achievement. Throughout the walk, as Gareth was describing the work done to develop or redevelop the area into the woodlands that could be accessed at all levels, he said quite a few times that others had told him that the area wasn't natural, that it was man-made. Gareth told us his response to this was that human involvement was just as integral to the development of the land and that humans have always had an involvement in the development of the land and that this current involvement by humans to return it to a natural state was not any different from, any other from the involvement of any other creatures. In her introduction to the language of landscape, Anne Winston Fern writes that the ideas of nature and what is natural stem from highly personal, strongly hold feelings and beliefs. And these beliefs are what Gareth is dealing with. Gareth himself holds strongly felt beliefs that as Winston Fern writes, all living things share the same space and all landscapes, wild or, or domesticated, are co-authored by all. Animals, humans, plants, the wind, the rain, etc. On the other side, people who say this redeveloped woodland is not a natural state have a belief in what Winston Fern terms first nature, a nature that represents a space unaltered by human labour and is natural, and that any human involvement in the land yields a second nature, a contrived, humanised, and defined landscape. But it is in this second nature 
in this contrived, humanised and divine landscape in which we all live and which we feel is a part of us, even if it is the landscape that we have come to rather than have been born into. On this final retreat at Flesbodza, in the mornings, in our heavy hiking shoes, we walked through woodlands, fields and on roads. In the afternoons, we drew, talked and meditated in a secluded, sunken garden. We walked barefoot in this garden, feeling the crispness of the grass, the warmth of the soil, our feet soothed by the damp grass. During the nights, most of the outer slept in tents with only a thin mattress separating them from the earth. We explored an environment that was not our own, just as we had done on the previous retreat. Both Julie and I, who had invited the others to share our Mr. Square, our square mile, were also from our square. Both of us had chosen this place, this landscape, this language to grasp ourselves, to embed it into our being along with the landscape already embedded from the place we call home. As part of the discussions, we explored Welsh words, and when our when asking the artists how they view their Carnarvon, which the literal translation is habitat, they came to the conclusion that they take their Carnarvon with them, like a type of bubble that you can carry with you, whether or not you feel rooted to the particular geographical space that you are currently inhabiting. During the project, I have been working with Dr. Lucy Taylor of International Politics in Aberystwyth University, and who was my supervisor for my PhD. Lucy searches for ideas and practices that might go into a full toolkit to help us all understand our relationship to Wales. She believes that ingenuity is about the commitment to a place on its terms, on the place's terms, not your own. Lucy's beliefs overlap with mine. I have grafted myself onto a land whose story is not my story and explored that land, the language and the culture, mainly not this space that is new to me, that is old as a country from where I came. I had embedded myself into a landscape that is not my own, and this landscape overlays the landscape that is the place that knows my bones, to quote Lucy. In my work for this project, I create images that show the co-location of the man-made and the natural, the transplanting of the new with the old. Through my work with Lucy, I have begun incorporating our thumbprint into my LIFO print as an alternative way of communicating who we are and our input into this. The land we have invited ourselves into, she seems to return to accept us. Writer Horatio Clare said, a key Conry, the Welsh land, a key Conry talks to us, sings to us, and I'm going to put it in my country Australian term, won't bloody well shut up. The research is nearly at the end of what I had originally planned, retreat, a working period, a final retreat and an exhibition. Um, that like the land and the questions we ask about the land, the research is continuing and has branched out into another project with artist or printmaker Jude Masson, Professor Mark Masson, who's an expert on water, Dr. Lucy Taylor, and 10 printmakers, most of whom live elsewhere, that have connections with Wales. This project, The Land is Other, consists of online meetings as a group and meetings between speakers. This project will culminate in an exhibition at the Impact Biannual Printmaking Conference, which will be held here in Bristol at, at the end of September. A catalogue has now been produced and the research and knowledge gained is currently being gathered together. And the exhibitions will allow, the exhibitions and the response well, allow me to find out where my research has led me and where it will lead me next. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to introduce Emma Jane Hong. So Emma is an artist who um, also studied at the MA at the um, Aberystwyth University. And she has been exploring the land for a long time, but she's now been um, she became part of my project back in September, and so she's going to talk a bit about being in that project, but also about where her work has developed over the last year and through the pandemic. Oh, so, thank you. Thank you very much. Right, first things first. Thank you, everybody. Can everyone hear me at the back? Say all right. You know, please feel free to come forwards if you. Um, I'm just going like that if I go quiet. Um, 
I am a painter. I originally came, trained as a printmaker and had a family and returned to study and uh, went to Aberystwyth University to do my master's in painting. Although I had done quite a lot of painting um, before then. Um, although I've looked at lots of different subjects, it's landscape that has been always called, called me back. Oh, uh, where we go? Doesn't like the fingers. Well, which one? Oh, that's not it. Oh, yeah, there we go. Right, I'm pressing one button. Okay, so here's two of my paintings that actually appeared in my master's exhibition. And I was particularly interested in how light hits a landscape. I've always loved walking, that meditative um, process, um, thinking. And as a student, I was, as a child, I was always criticized for daydreaming. I think it's an essential skill, personally. Um, it's that being in the moment, it's stopping, seeing where you are and observing. So I like to go out into the landscape, make notes, and these are acrylic paintings. They're about 30 centimetres square, so they're not very big. I'm working quite small at the moment. And I'm looking for those moments when you're out walking and the light catches you and you just think, I've not noticed that before. I'm trying to capture those moments so that I can share them with other people. And everybody has very busy eyes and I want them to, to have that. Okay. So I take my sketchbook out into the landscape. This is a local feature called the Horseshoe Pass. I live in North Wales. And quite often I just take my sketchbook. I forgot to put the timer on, never mind. Um, <laughs> uh, this time I usually take a sketchbook with a pen. This time I took some oil pastels. And this example shows what I'm drawing. Okay. So when I get back to the studio, um, I layer thin layers of paint. And with these, the last couple of years, well, since my master's, so about four or five years now, I haven't used a paintbrush. I use like um, a paddle, like a palette, and you spread it across. Um, and I wanted to go beyond the edges so that I could frame things to help people focus on that thing. So if this works, this is a little video. Let's see if I can get it to work. Mm, maybe not. Is it going to work? Oh, that's a shame. That this one. No. Should we? We'll just fix that. That's fine. Anyway, a little frame comes over so you can see the pictures. I apologise. Okay. Keep facing. That's fine. I apologise. We've got this audience and yourselves at home. Thank okay. you. Thank that's you. all right. <laughs> um, COVID lockdown. Everybody needed a pause. I felt it really difficult to go outside and paint. Um, so I had to rethink and painted my fence with the rainbow um, for my neighbour. This is my home. I feel very fortunate to live in North Wales. And I live on the borders of England and Wales, um, overlooking the Dee Valley and down the valley to Shangoshan. Some of you may have heard of that. It's a beautiful spot. So, oh, I've lost a picture. Never mind. I um, spent time building a greenhouse, building a vegetable garden, doing all those other things that you just think, oh, I'll do that later, I'll do that later. And COVID provided us with the time to actually do these things. Where have all my slides gone? <laughs> I had loads of, oh, beautiful vegetables. Please imagine them. Um, <laughs> the amazing pictures of vegetables. Um, and it got me to research about, uh, because I was spending so much time with the soil, so much time with the land, I was starting to learn about sustainable living, um, about home produce, about the soil, about composting. Oh, I love compost. Um, and I started to read all these papers about um, researching about the climate change and also um, policies that have been put in place. Now, we live in a area of outstanding natural beauty. How is that going to impact my view? That's what I'm think, looking at. It got me thinking, things have got to change. Things have got to change in the way that we behave, but things that also have to visually change. As an artist, as a painter, how are things, how is my view, my familiar view, which has become even more familiar when we've been locked down COVID and we can't go so far, how is that going to change? I'm going to let you read that. I 
tipo de madeira. Tá. I think it got off the picture again. So, while I was doing all this research, I also found out about a fantastic local project which had been running for a couple of years. It was a five-year national lottery funded project involving 11 national and local agencies. And they were all working together. Their brief was to protect the natural and historical features, reinstate the iconic and defining views, bearing in mind we have the Bronco Sushi Aqueduct here, which is a World Heritage Site, which I've beautifully illustrated here. Um, Interpret the heritage significance, engage with the audience, and connect local communities to the landscape. There we go. So apart from just drawing the landscape, I uh, contacted these people and said, okay, I can just see these voluntary um, activities you have. Rather than coming along and participating in them, I'd like to come along and draw them. I want to draw them. I want to listen to your knowledge and I want to listen to the participants' knowledge. I wanted to get a feel of, is there any change? Is there a shift? And I became really fascinated with people's postures. And I just took it back to basics with my pen and my sketchbooks and just went out and did some drawings, which I was really enjoying. I was learning about the tools they were using. This is not complex stuff. It's really, really simple. Um, and there were trees that they were cutting down to open up views. Another of the reasons that I was attracted to this picturesque landscape is the idea of picturesque. What we're looking at, what we're seeing, what I've been painting for years and romanticising as you know, lovely landscape, how much of it is natural? And I started to question that. And how much of it is, in, is um, by interference with the human beings and the animals that we farm on it? So all of that's going on, quite busy. Um, there's more things he's missing. Uh, only last week I went and watched the installation of a bench, um, which had been... Technology onto technology. Okay. Are we able to machines? In 1994, physicist Ursula Frankel okay. observed that... Are we good? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I thought I'd just shut up. It... No, no, don't worry. That's fine. I don't know what's happened there. There we go. Oh, here's another. Um, apart from looking at large vistas and landscapes, which have been part of my composition of my work, I'm finding myself looking at slightly smaller compositions, things that were a little bit closer. So that's kind of an influence of the work from going out and engaging with a much more local landscape rather than getting in the car and driving. All the places I'm drawing at the moment are reached by foot. Oh, hang on, have I gone back now? Uh, no, nope, I've gone back, right, come on. Oh, technical, I'm pressing to go back and it's not going back. Oh. We live with the land. I was invited by Veronica um, to be part of, um, well, I applied to be part and got accepted on the We Live With The Land project. It was an opportunity to meet with other artists working from Wales, looking at the land, engaging with the land in a variety of ways. Um, I chose to go, be going out and painting it, but I really relished the opportunity to go and talk to other people that were working with um, different materials and interpreting different angles really gave me lots to think about. Okay, we won't have that one. That was, <laughs> ah, we'll have this one. Uh, just before we left, I went to visit, this is where I go very regularly with my dog. And as I said previously, well, I hope I did, um, I'm looking at what policies and places have been put in place to address um, the climate change? What physical changes am I going to see in my landscape? This is my local park area, and they dug up, they scrapped the straight door side of the grass area. And I thought, oh no, they're going to put a paved footpath in. Oh no. Um, but no, they've actually cleaned it or scoured it or scratched it, scratched it um, to plant a wildflower bed. So 
that's the physical changes that we're starting to see. This is my last slide. I'll let you read it. And this is one of my paintings that's in progress. And um, I hope that my paintings provide people uh, or help people appreciate what we've got. And when they take them away to their homes, they are a place for them to rest their eyes. Thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry about the technical stuff. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name's Dawn Fay. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at Western Sydney University. And I've, I'll end this presentation with... Um, what can I say? COVID-19 sucked. It really sucked. My field works are bust. Locked out, locked in, locked down in Australia. Victoria in New South Wales. I can't get to the UK. COVID-19 sucks. I feel helpless, hopeless. Completing my field work is crucial. It's vital. It's the key to my project my dissertation. Ah, okay, got it. Finally, I'm free, or so I thought, to encounter my ancestral pandemic landscapes. Drawing on the words of women writers to craft erasure poetry, through the words of Virginia Woolf and Susan Sontag, who both wrote about their personal subjective sociocultural experience of living with illness. Adopting their words helps me to imagine and express what it must have been like for my ancestors arriving in Australia from the United Kingdom at the height of the Asiatic flu, 1889, and the Spanish flu pandemic. 1918. Borrowing the words of Wolf and Sontag <coughs> helps me frame my embodied subjective experience of living through another pandemic. As I said, finally, I thought I was free. Relying on technology, I walk, I listen, I talk, I record. Framing autoethnographic processes, mediated understandings, incidentally, accidentally, shaping my art making, pushing back, art marking against COVID 19. Embodying a sense of place, voicing the landscape, becoming a becoming a dialogic encounter, ghostly ancestral voices, silence, ghostly screams, disembodied others, my embodied self is scarred by COVID-19. Disembodied voices, ghostly hauntings, surrounding echoes, colonial patriarchal pandemic landscapes. Uh, these, both these images taken in Victoria one on the left is um, from Ballarat, um, and the one on the right is um, a local one in Kings Lake. Whoops. Make a scholar. Oh, I think I've gone. No, sense making. Sorry about that. Um, unmaking sense of place, affective, emotive sense ability. Acknowledging privilege, tender, careful, new beginnings, place making sense abilities, art marking, materialising dialogic conversations, tacitly informing my experiential art making. Clonal markings become a becoming, an art making experience. I feel bereft ghostly ancestral landscape roamings. Uh, this is taken in um, Epsom, Surrey, uh, which was where my grandfather met my nana before they um, immigrated to Australia. Can you just try and put in this stuff here? And then... That's right, I'll hold it. 
Yeah. yeah. And, and then it just directs you a bit more to, to yeah, yeah. here so that they yep. can hear online. Yep, no, that's cool. Um, okay. Unfolding, crafting my scholarly self, my embodied self, my disembodied other, blending skin to skin, entangled disembodied voices, inscribing bodies, inscribing ghostly ancestral pandemic stories, seeking safety, searching out a safe place, one that Manning tells me reinforces feelings of aliveness and existence. Becoming alive on the page, becoming creative, crafting, forming a skin as container, expressing myself, my ghostly colonial others, visualising empathy through poetic responding. <coughs> Connecting through art beyond words, the texture of language, cross-pollinating my art markings, my paintings, my photographs, expressing an urgency of violent scarring, a scored pitted surface cuts deep, a breaking down, a breaking through, adding, subtracting, bleeding, processing gut-wrenching pain, silent tears, art making, visible, what is invisible. Processing effective experience, speaking trauma, processing helplessness, bodily pain, ghostly hauntings, affecting the effective effects of art making, roaming through healing, art working. Again, this is in Victoria. Situating experience, weaving critical theory, entangling theory, entangling art, entangling words with theory, making theoretical connections, Holman Jones and Harris tell me this is an effective sense of something happening. Unspoken words, speaking my body, crafting ghostly landscapes, visualizing something that has altered something to make something else. Combining my art marking, making words with those of Harris, making new arguments and engaging with old material at the intersection of imagination, sociality, theory and cultural politics. Harnessing effective relationships in this place at this time, exposing colonised, internalised ghostly ancestors, skin to skin, entangled roots, reinforcing liveliness, holding space, becoming material objects, crossing techno technological divides, sense-making, worldling, roaming material landscapes. It was an intuitive response when I finally got to start my field work in Victoria was to shoot with infrared. Um, so these are unprocessed images. The previous images with the um, purple themes through them were shot with full spectrum colour um, infrared. And containing COVID this way and that way. These theoretical methods explore how theory rubs up against everyday life, bridging a presence, a gap, manifesting absence, ghostly otherness. Extending ideas, locating absence and space, visualising agency, material locations, bearing witness to embodied traumatic experience. I think I've screwed up the photos, but that's okay. Um, embodied words becoming metaphors, past pandemic landscapes, guiding, unfolding, storing, framing feelings, imagining. I can only wonder what it must have been like for my ancestors arriving at the height of the Asiatic flu, my nana arriving in Australia in 1918, 
their nine-month-old daughter dying from the Spanish flu. Quarantine, station, hospital, desolate, unwelcome community, infectious disease, disinfecting, foul influenza bathhouse, people, animals, processed, death, morgue, cemetery. Read the Haas words draw me close. Vulnerability, death, empathy, distress and mourning, unspeakableness, sorry, immigrant, loss, complex history, witnessing, trauma, struggle, sacrifices, fear, emotional, depression, anxiety, empty, painful, tears, loneliness, neediness, heartbreaking, intimate stories. Ruth Bahar declares, we need to read poetry to understand silences and pauses, to tell a story, to tell a story that leaves us breathless. Or as Liz McKinley observes, we need to write the heartlines of feminist autobiography. Thank you. Uh, that's it, folks. If there's any questions anyone would like to ask of any of the presenters, 